The following interview was conducted uh, with W. Dale Compton, Emeritus Professor at the College of uh, School of Industrial Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, May the 28th, 2008 at Stewart Center on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years and siblings. Well, Catherine, I was born in a <clears throat> small town on a farm south of Danville, Indiana. Sorry, Danville, Illinois, um, about 20 miles south of Danville, and I grew up on a farm. And brothers or sisters? Any siblings? I had one brother who was 12 years older than me, and okay. so it was almost as if I didn't have a sibling. He was so much older. Did you go to lo uh, school right nearby? Tell us a little about going to grade school and high I, school. I uh, went to a one-room schoolhouse that was right across from my home for the first six years. And then um, how many school How many students were there? Oh about? my, I don't remember. Small. Maybe a handful, maybe okay. a dozen. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Turns out that my brother went to that same school and part of that time he was the only student in the school. Oh my goodness. Um, but then the school consolidated with those in the town of Chrisman and so I spent uh, the seventh and eighth grade and my high school years in, in those schools. Uh, I, World War II came along and I had enough credits in high school so that I left high school after my junior year without a diploma um, and, and went to Wabash College. The intent was to try and get a at least a semester, maybe a year of college before being drafted. And the war ended in the, the December of that year, so um, I just continued on. But that was quite an experience for a 17-year-old to be thrown in with a bunch of returning veterans. It, uh, how did you, tell us a little bit about that, and how did you happen to select Wabash? How did you happen to go there? <clears throat> I made an application to University of Chicago and was admitted, and my parents wouldn't let me go. Um, and uh, a friend of my father's there in town was an early graduate of Wabash, and he suggested uh, that and arranged to have them come and sit down and talk to my, my parents and assure them that I would survive. <laughs> so uh, that was quite, a, quite an experience. Yeah. I enjoyed it immensely. What year did you enter uh, at Wabash? What year was that? Um, 44. Okay. And tell us a little about what college and, was like for you. I, so I graduated in June of 49. Mm -hmm. It's an all men's school, of course, and only one of four have remain in the United States today. Uh, it's also a liberal arts school, and so um, uh, my major was physics, and so I uh, enjoyed very much the, that experience of Okay. Did and you, I was very uh, much influenced by the head of the physics department there mm -hmm. in terms of... What was the campus like? like? And did you uh, join a fraternity? Yes, I was a member of Delta Tau Delta. Okay. What, did they, what sort of social activity did they have? Did they have some close by for uh, girls the, would come? Uh, well, uh, there certainly were not any co-ed. Uh, but as a result, we were only about 20 miles from DePaul. And a lot of the fellows would go to the pond. Well, of course, a close relationship there. Saturday night. And, <laughs> and so transportation in those days you could make by, by, uh, by getting out on the highway and, and uh, <laughs> dragging down someone who would give you a ride. Sure, that's right. Yeah. No did, you ever, did you ever happen to come into Lafayette at all? I did, um, two or three times to um, football games. and. Uh, we used to stay overnight at the Delt House there in the corner of Grant and, and Northwestern. And when I came here for the faculty, I, I kept saying, there's something wrong. I don't understand. Well, of course, there used to be a big open field where technology is now, <laughs> right across from the Delt House. And uh, yeah, it was a, I did not, well, I, I later came to, uh, excuse me, I later came to, um, to know, um, uh, one of the senior graduate students here, uh, my professor at Wabash in physics was Dwayne Rohr, <clears throat> and his son, Dwayne Rohr, got, received his PhD in physics from him. 
and so I, I, had, I did know him uh, a bit sure. you know, when I was in school. Okay. When, when you graduated, then what, tell us what, ha what you did after you graduated <clears throat> from Wabash. Well, I thought I wanted to go into geophysics. And uh, when Roller, Dr. Roller said to me, well, you should go to Oklahoma. Uh, that's where they have good geophysics. So I did, but discovered after being there that to them geophysics simply meant oil prospecting. And so <laughs> upon finishing my, my master's degree, uh, I worked for two or three years, was married, and then went to Illinois. But the tenure at Oklahoma led to a very special relationship with, with uh, Mrs. Jitsky. Um, the first weekend that the Jitskys were on campus after his, he came to be president. Here at, at Purdue? Here at Purdue, uh -huh. they, they, had a, uh, they had an open house and a, and a reception for all the named professors on campus. And I had never met Martin. Uh, as I started to go through the line, I knew he had been at Oklahoma. I said, well, you know, I, my, well, Gene and I were graduates of Oklahoma. I, I got my master's there. And uh, he said, oh, who would you work for? I said, uh, it was Dr. Richard Fowler. And he just stood there with my hand in his, turned around and said, Pat, our, one of our named professors did his master's degree with your father. <laughs> Lord, what a small world. So, so we, Pat, Pat, Patty and I had a very special relationship. Well, absolutely. And at one time, her father had told me that his daughter had married the Dean of Engineering, and I never made that connection. <laughs> Interesting. Well, talk about family. Did you meet your wife uh, out we, there? We met in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was mm -hmm. she a student there? or She received her degree in um, social work. Okay, all right. Then after you got your master's, what was next? <coughs> the rest of your graduate studies. Um, I went, well, I worked for the U.S. Navy in, at what was then called the Naval Ordnance Test Station. It's now called the Naval Weapons Center in China Lake, California uh, for, oh, two and a half, maybe, I guess, yeah, but two and a half years or so. Um, and um, we were married after Jean graduated and uh, so she was out there with me for about a year and a half. And then we, uh, the Navy offered me a scholarship, fellowship to, to uh, complete my education. And so I went to the University of Illinois then. And it was called solid state physics then, it's now called uh, condensed matter. It changes, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, again, a very, very rich environment. All right. Well, it was nice to be back in Illinois. Your parents were still alive at the My time. My parents were still alive. Uh huh. So it made it sort of coming back home. So they got to see. We got to see them on occasion, not a lot. <laughs> oh. So now, when so we, when you finished and you were you do you were um, in the Navy then a research fit? Would you work? Were you in the Navy? At, I, I was not in the Navy. Okay. I was a civilian. <clears throat> okay. And I then, but because of that fellowship, um, I had an obligation to work for the Navy for. Uh, four or five years. Sure. And so um, we went to Washington to the Neville Research Laboratory and was a research uh, physicist there for him. Very good. And for Six years, I guess. Okay. Did you enjoy living in Washington or did you live in Virginia? No, we lived in Washington. Well, we lived both in Washington and Maryland. Uh-huh. <coughs> it's, um, we had the experience of two or three weeks ago of we had a little time in in um, Washington before a meeting started, and uh, Gene and I drove out to the place where we built our first house, and uh, one should never do that. <laughs> it's never the way you remember. It. <laughs> <laughs> I've experienced that in the house that we grew up in, having seen it. I know what you mean. Okay. Um, then you, uh, after you got your PhD, what was what was your next step? Did you? Uh, that, was you that was Washington and the okay. Naval and Research then, uh, And uh, in 1961, then I returned to Illinois on the faculty in physics. Okay, so you spent there some time. Uh, um, we spent from 61, 1961 to 1970. Okay. 
uh, and from 64, I hope my date's right, from 64 to 70, I was uh, on the fact, still on the faculty of physics, but I was director of the Coordinated Science Laboratory, okay. which is an interdisciplinary engineering laboratory at, uh, at one campus. It's a pretty good size one. Has it been there for quite a while? Is it still going? It's still in operation? It, it started, it was started, um, let's see, that would have been in 61. I think it was started in 54. Okay. <clears throat> So that was kind of a good comment. Uh, good. Then, um, was it the next step then Ford Motor? Is next that, step how did, Ford Motor. Uh, how did, so you switched from academia into the corporate world, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in, in the late 60s, the Vietnam War was in progress. The lab was supported by the Department of Defense. And we spent more time trying to explain things, uh, trying to be sure that there was no vandalism than we did teaching. And that became a bit tiresome. Okay. Um, plus the fact that I finally decided if you really want to have an impact on, on, the, on the technical sector that you're working in, you have to be where it, may, it really makes a difference that the problems get solved. Mm -hmm. And we were so removed from the Department of Defense, it was hard to see how uh, we were having much impact. Sure, I understand. And that was the beginning of the environmental issues at the time in terms of uh, emissions from cars. And so it, um, it, was a, it was a good, happy coincidence. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what were your responsibilities in your, at uh, Ford Motor? <coughs> well, I went Ford. as director of the Physics and Chemistry Laboratory in the research staff. Uh, and then um, two years later was named Vice President of Research. Mm -hmm. And I kept that title until I retired from Ford in 76. Uh, and, yes, in, uh, no, 86, Eight. sorry, 86. Uh -huh. um, the research activity at Ford uh, encompassed almost every technical activity that the company uh, interfaced with, from the design of cars, new engines, control of emissions, manufacturing technology, new materials. And so it, it offered an insight into the workings of the company that it would have been hard to see otherwise. Mm -hmm. Did your uh, position in, uh, involve any traveling at all? Did you travel uh, either in-state in or out of the uh, um, United States? Well, yes, there was, there was a considerable amount of travel. A lot of it was foreign travel. Mm -hmm. uh, at one time, I was <coughs> the, the director of a joint Japanese automotive per, um, Ford Motor Company Exxon uh, program to, to develop better engines. So there was a good deal of travel to, to Japan, okay. Europe. Very good, okay. Well, and let's move on to um, School of Industrial Engineering. You came <laughs> in uh, 1988. Tell us a little about some of your teaching and the research area and committees and things of that sort. Also the uh, student chapter, which won some things, their um, interaction when you came. When I came to, to uh, when I came back to academia, <clears throat> I was given some good advice by my older son. He said, you know, Dad, you're, you're going back because you want to work with students. He said, why don't you try and become a, uh, a faculty advisor to a student chapter of something? And uh, I mentioned it to Ford Limekuller when we were here after he came. He said, well, the, the, the uh, faculty advisor for Alpha Pi Mu, the Honorary Society for Industrial Engineering, is just leaving. And he said, are you sure you'd like to try that? And it was, a, it was a wonderful experience because sure. I got acquainted with all of the very leading top students That's right. in yeah. industrial engineering. Right. So that was just a very, and, and that, during that time, we had the pleasure of having um, Lillian Gilder's daughter. Uh, Ernestine? Ernestine. Uh, to come to dinner at our house when all the, the young people were there from Alpha Pi Mu. And she just had a wonderful time. 
it was, it was really a Tell us a little bit about your contact with Ernestine, for because we have the Gilbreth collection, as you know, in the archives. Right. Well, uh, she's an incident. She's now deceased. I, I mentioned that for the researchers. Yeah, no, no. Um, we didn't have much personal contact with her. Uh, I saw her briefly on two or three other occasions when she was on the campus, but um, uh, she happened to be here for some length of time that that one time, and so we saw more of her then. But I had some correspondence with her. But that's um, right. it, it was. You didn't visit her when you were in California. No, I did not home. visit her in uh -huh. California. Well, that was a that was a plus for the students then to get to meet oh, her. I think I think so, but she just enjoyed it so very oh, much. Oh, I imagine yes. What were your some of your research in the production management? Some of your research areas. Tell us a bit well, about the, that. Well, my research area was in uh, manufacturing processes, and. Early on, I became uh, very much acquainted with uh, faculty member uh, Chandra Sekar, Professor Chandra Sekar, and he and I not only became close friends, but we found that we had a lot in common technically, and so a lot of my research has, has been associated with him in one way or another. We've co-chaired committees uh, for students. Uh, uh, co-sponsored research projects and so forth. Mm -hmm. It has to do with improving manufacturing processes. Uh, his background in mechanical engineering and mine in both physics and, and uh, some manufacturing at Ford uh, were very complimentary and very, sure. very, uh, very how was How was the funding sources? Was that uh, somewhat we challenging? We had a lot of funding from industry, uh, some from the National Science Foundation, uh, right now, um, there's well, there's some funding from the, from the state of Indiana, 21st Century Fund. Uh, I would say though that more than half of it has been direct uh, grants from uh, industry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's sort of good. Okay, um, we weren't everything to do with the student technical paper contest that they used to have. Or do have. No, I did not. But that's um, a big thing that was right. going for quite a while, industrial yeah, engineering. But I did not participate sure. in that. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about when uh, you became the interim head. How did uh, your role change a little bit when you were interim head of the school? Well. <coughs> what were some of your responsibilities and any challenges that uh, the opportunities presented? Um, being a manager in a university as a head of a school or department in a university is so different than being a manager in industry that um, that transition can be very difficult. Now, the fact that I've been in, uh, at the University of Illinois and a manager of an interdisciplinary lab there for six years uh, made that transition pretty much more direct and easy. Uh, I've seen how difficult it can be, though, in some people who come directly into a university it's at a senior position that have never before been there. Um, oh, it's, it's how you handle people, how you stimulate them, how you work with them, and right. it's the same both places. Right. It's a big community out there. That's right. Uh, did you still kept? Uh, were you still teaching during that time as well? I she taught. I taught during that time. Uh -huh. I'm no longer teaching classes now, though I still have that um, some research with uh, Professor Chandra Sekar. Uh -huh. And I have to, I, I miss it in the sense that uh, I do not have an opportunity to meet the younger students, the undergraduates. Right. And uh, that's, that's a... Did you teach both undergrad and graduate students well, in I your days? Well, I taught both 500 and 600 level courses. Uh -huh. And a 500 level course usually had, was about half populated with undergraduates and, and right. half with graduates. Okay. Um, do you make any change? How the curriculum? Were there any changes in curriculum when you were the interim head? Or, no, not, that? nothing serious. What about di diversity uh, within the school? That came in with the strategic plan, of course. You had the strategic um, plan during that time. Well, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I, had, I, I was responsible for bringing the only African-American faculty member to engineering at the time. <laughs> good. Who's still on the faculty, in fact. Good, very good, okay. Um, student body-wise, um, we had quite a number of non-U.S. born students, but the percentage was lower than it is now. Mm -hmm. um, 
industrial engineering has always been attractive to, to women. As a result, we've always had a significant number of women in our classes and doing graduate work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, that is a nice, nice combination. Right, yes, I understand. One of the, the awards that your school gives is that Outstanding Industrial Engineer, the OIE. Tell us a little bit about that award for the researchers. It, uh, are you involved in how the selection or well, any the, just the, general comments? The, the selection on that, uh, and this may be done differently in every school, I don't know. Okay. But, uh, just for your school? In industrial time. engineering, uh, there are nominations can be offered by anyone on the faculty, and the primary committee makes the ultimate choice of who goes forward to the, to the uh, uh, well, they make the choice of who will receive that award. And from those people, those, from that f grouping, it is generally true that the nominations for Distinguished Alumni Award and f for all of engineering comes from that group. And so it's the first step recognition generally mm -hmm. uh, toward the, toward the um, uh, Distinguished uh, Engineering Award. Right. Right. Um, one tries to look, I think it's, it's the faculty are, pr are rather conscientious in this. They really try to look for people who have made a, a significant contribution in the area in which they're working. And it's not always in engineering. Right. We've had lawyers, we've had business people, we've had engineers. It's, um, it's their contribution in the field that they chose. Mm -hmm. But the impact, of the, draw, the draw to that is the industrial engineering training and education that, that they've had. That's correct. And they've and, made and their impact in somewhat di little different in the profession and, from that and standpoint. It, it's, and it may be that they only received a bachelor's degree or maybe they have masters or PhDs. That right. has not been a criterion. Uh, and we've seen some outstanding people. Right. When you were the interim head, did you visit the alumni chapters at all? Was there any travel involved with that? And what about fundraising? Because that was during the time of the strategic um, uh, campaign for Purdue. I did not do a lot of fundraising, although, and and the reason, the reason really was because it was an interim appointment. Okay. And alumni like to see the, the permanent people. I see. Uh, I did, did you? I, I did make some trips. We did um, uh, rebuild some of the contacts with alumni, but it it wasn't the same as it would should be. Sure. If it but you're able to make some contacts and keep the flow, keep the it, communication that, going, which correct. people sometimes is, is very key, I that, think. That's correct. All right, yeah. okay. Um, and, and we, we <coughs> industrial engineering is, um, is really blessed with having a significant number of very successful alumni, CEOs of major corporations, uh, so that there's an opportunity there to mm. really. Let me ask you this: Do you think the field has changed somewhat over your period of time that you've been involved in it? Oh yes, very much. Would you, for uh, researchers, would you make some general comment how you the, see that, uh, view that? Many of the schools of industrial engineering around the country have diminished their effort on manufacturing. Uh, they have enhanced their effort on, on operations research, uh, human factors, production, but the manufacturing processes outside of those of semiconductors has been, has, has been diminished. And much of the semiconductor manufacturing activity goes on within electrical engineering schools around the country. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing now is the uh, growth in uh, programs having to do with the service sector. And uh, that, of course, is where the uh, uh, health care delivery activity here at Purdue uh, is such an important contributor. Right, yeah. Is men is do you think the role of manufacturing because it's changed as a pro, as a as an industry within the country has affected what, it? It has in the following sense. Um, with the movement of a lot of manufacturing offshore, it has not it has not been viewed by students as an 
as an attractive an avenue as some of the other. Right. Right. And um, it's not that the technology has decreased. The advent of complete robotic systems, for example, and so forth, <clears throat> very important technologies there still, but the students haven't found it as attractive an avenue to pursue as they did. For the over the long haul, That's because right. of the the change in where it's being actually done. I see. See the the uh, engineering research center that we had at Purdue was uh, the early one was on computer based manufacturing. Uh, it was I think the, it was in the first group that were ever awarded by the National Science Foundation, and um, it was the leading manufacturing activity in the country for a number of years. And that persisted for 10 or 11 years here. Pretty. Yeah. That was a big operation. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. How about the National Academy of, of Engineering? You've been, you were elected the Home Secretary. Tell us a little bit about what that involved with the National Academy. Oh, the Home Secretary is responsible for all the membership issues, both good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> if, if but it's based in Washington, right? <laughs> it's based in Washington. Um, if members have a complaint, <laughs> they know who to call. <laughs> but the elections and all the procedures that go with those, and uh, uh, committee membership uh, with, with the president uh, decide, suggest nominations for all of those. Uh, and so it's, a, it's, it's uh, keeping contact with the members in a way that they feel that they're part of the organization, right. even though they're okay. strung out all over the country and around the world. Do you do as much, was there much travel involved with that? There's a lot of traveling in the United States. I do not travel out. Uh, there is a foreign secretary that handles the membership outside. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, U.S. I, I, I uh, assemble about 50,000 miles of, of uh, frequent, fire, frequent right? flyer points every year. <laughs> We'll stick with you. <laughs> we'll travel with you. <laughs> oh, how are you still on? Are you still with that? It's a certain term that, term appointment, is it not? Well, uh, you can be elected for two <coughs> two consecutive four year terms, and that's all. Mm -hmm. And my years com concludes in July one, this oh, okay. two thousand and eight. Okay, all right. So that's that's why my earlier comment to you is my traveling is going to. <laughs> <laughs> One of, yeah, one of the books that you did that, uh, w the design and analysis of integrated manufacturing, How to Survive in a Global Economy, tell us a little bit about that one. That's very well received and uh, well, well used. Well, that was a study that we did um, when I became um, senior fellow at the National Academy of Engineering after I retired from Ford. Uh, the thought at that time with the president that it would be good for the academy to have some presence in manufacturing. And so we arranged a, a symposium. Uh, it was well attended in Washington, uh, two or three hundred people there, uh, to talk about these various things. We had very uh, outstanding people. Uh, one that comes to mind is John White, who was Dean of Engineering at Georgia Tech later, and then later President, just now stepping down as Chancellor at uh, University of Arkansas. Uh, people like that were, and talked about their research areas of interest. And uh, that was published then by the National Academy Press a, mm -hmm. with their papers and their Presentations. And yeah, and it was to how to how to survive in to, in a global economy, which kind of a key thing there. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. A lot of discussion that continues on even to, even in today. It's times right. Talking about writing, one of the things is that uh, paper that you did about building a better delivery system, and certainly was the Reagan Street <clears throat> Center for Healthcare Engineering, uh, which is on campus. Tell us a little bit about that. That was involved. also a study that was. Um, <clears throat> grew from a discussion that the director of the program office at the National Academy of Engineering and I had had over the years about um, service sector, 
what the academy should be doing in it. Um, Proctor Reed is the director of that office, and he's, he concluded that let's have a very small workshop of a dozen people, and half of them engineers, half from the medical profession, and, and let's ask them, is there enough content in this question of engineering, what engineering could bring to healthcare delivery, that we should do a full-fledged study? And that group of people concluded quite unanimously that there was. And so uh, Dr. Reed uh, went about securing the funds, it was supported by the National Science Foundation and the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, we brought together uh, about 12 people, maybe 14, I think. Again, half of them engineers, half of them uh, physicians or uh, medical practitioners. We held three workshops in which we invited approximately 20 people at each one to come in and give us their view on a topic relevant to this that they were particularly familiar with. Um, and then the committee using that and their own expertise set about writing that report. Mm -hmm. And the report includes not only the, the uh, conclusions of the committee, but also all of the 50 papers that were presented at those mm -hmm. three workshops. What were some of the topics that seemed to be pretty hot? For I'm thinking for the researchers, if uh, they may want to read this, but what are some of the things that there's come to a, mind? There's a chapter having to do with uh, engineering tools many of which are come from the field of industrial engineering <clears throat> that would uh, relate to how do you improve efficiency, how do you improve quality, how do you reduce errors. Um, there's also some uh, tools that are not sufficiently developed yet for the healthcare, but could be, but uh, some of the financial engineering tools uh, some risk analysis tools, for example. Uh, there's another chapter on information technology and how it can be used. Uh, one paper there that uh, suggests that um, every hospital room could be made an intensive care unit by the use of uh, better monitoring and wireless communications so that you did not put as many people in the room, or as many uh, staff people in the room, but you had all the same information as if you had those people there. Um, better health records, better electronic uh, uh, prescription, communi communication of prescriptions electronically. Uh, then there's a um, uh, then there's a section on conclusions about what uh, actions that the government and uh, various uh, groups involved in healthcare delivery uh, should consider or take. Uh, one of those important ones is the, uh, again, the information technology. There are two bills going through Congress today uh, that have lifted pages of the of that report as part of the justification. Uh, a major recommendation also was that the government should set up 30 to 50 multidisciplinary research centers around the country uh, that would bring together both engineers and health practitioners so that they could begin working side by side, have enough time together so they could learn to speak the same language uh, develop new methods of um, delivery techniques, demonstrate them, help help uh, implement them. Mm -hmm. None of those have been funded, and um, uh, I don't know what the future is likely to be for that. But mm -hmm. Reagan Street here comes the closest. It's not quite in that pattern because there are not medical people involved except nursing. Uh, 
but it's the closest to. Mm -hmm. What do the uh, that conference in the paper had had was some had some impact on the Reagan Street Center coming to Purdue? You think? Well, they were aware of the study. It the, actually the paper wasn't. I don't think the paper actually came out until after the agreement oh. by the institute to fund this. Um, but it was used, has been used quite a lot in terms of the, of mm -hmm. the uh, uh, philosophy of how you attract people to, from what areas, how they, should, what kind of topics they can work in, uh, and and so in that sense, it, I think it has been influential. Mm -hmm. Are they going to? Uh, you say that nursing is in there. Do they plan to bring in some other? Well, uh, there's types? a lot of activity with with uh, various. Um, uh, medical groups, particularly in Indianapolis, with the Veterans Administration, with uh, the uh, Indiana Medical Group, part of the uh, university. Uh, there are various hospitals around the state, uh, but they aren't in resident in the center. But there are pro joint programs. All right, okay. At, uh, They're working in collaboration. At their institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's been funded and refunded too. It's been refunded and okay. it's, in a, it's very healthy in terms of the funding. Two million dollars a year now for the next five years. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Tell us a little about your family. And, uh, you have, do you have any children? And well, what are... yes. We have three children. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> our oldest son is on the faculty at Vanderbilt. Uh, the younger son is on the faculty at Dartmouth. And our daughter is um, director of operations for for Discover Card in Chicago. Oh. What uh, disciplines are your two sons in? Uh, any in physics? Well, um, <clears throat> I'll give the answer from my older son in a little more protracted way. <laughs> he, he graduated from Michigan in chemical engineering. This is the one at Vanderbilt? This is one at Vanderbilt. Oh. Graduated from ch in, uh, chemical engineering at Michigan. Uh, went to graduate school at Northwestern and finished his master's degree. And came home and said, "You know, Dad, I don't think I want to do engineering for my lifetime." So um, I said, "Well, what do you want to do?" And he said, "Well, <clears throat> I think I want to work with disadvantaged children." I said, "Okay, I'll make you. I'll make a deal. You go off and work for a year, and see if you really like that. And if you do, you have to promise to come back and get your PhD." So he went to a school for the dyslexic in Boston and taught uh, math for a year. Came home and said, yeah, that's what I want to do. So he went back to Northwestern, got his degree in education, and he's now on the faculty for special education at Vanderbilt. Very good. He's at the Peabody School. He's got a nice background that kind of mixed will work out <clears throat> nicely. <laughs> but, uh, it, it was, and I have to say, it was the right thing for him to do. Good. What uh, discipline is your son in at Dartmouth? Um, He's a molecular biologist, but he's in the medical school at Dartmouth. Oh, okay, All right. And so um, he's uh, uh, teaches, does research there, and has just been named the director of the cancer, uh, what they call a cancer me mechanism uh, research program, I think is the title oh, of it. Very good, that's nice. Um, got some awards. Tell us one the, um, that uh, M. Eugene Merchant Manufacturing Medal from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. You got that a couple of that, years ago. That, that was, was a joint award by the uh, <coughs> the uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineers and the uh, Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Um, and I have no idea who nominated me. <laughs> a lot of people say that, but somebody did, right? Somebody uh, did. Well, it was, a, it was a surprise, though? Oh, sure. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best kind. <laughs> I, could, I, I probably would have told them that they shouldn't have done it if they had known <laughs> it. No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, some reflections on your emeritus status. Anything that you care to comment on? Or what you've been, you've been keeping pretty busy. I've been very busy. No. Um, uh, the school's been generous enough to allow me to keep my office, which I greatly appreciate, um, and uh, that enhances the interaction with the graduate students. Uh, and 
I, I do miss the contact with the undergraduates. Uh, nothing more fun than seeing a bunch of undergraduates. You're, you're talking about students. There's one thing that you should share. You had them always had them over to your house for the at the end of the year. Well, um, what was that? Uh, some of your grad students. So you kept that off campus thing, which was really have, nice. We haven't been doing that quite so much in the more recent years. Um, but we always had the, uh, at least the officers of Alpha Pi Mu over every Christmas. And then we'd have our, uh, the graduate students over. Right. And um, That's a very nice tradition, it, and you did it for quite a while. It's, one of, our, one of my, our former students stopped in my office last week. He just came back to campus to show his wife around the, new wife around the campus. He stopped in. And um, he told her about coming to our house. <laughs> See, so, so the, it 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 did leave a right a, a nice feeling. I think we enjoyed it so much. Isn't that as you look back, that's the thing you like to keep in touch. And when they stop in or you hear oh, from yeah. them at the holiday, it, it the the world just keeps getting smaller all Absolutely. the time. Yeah, that's very nice. How about an outstanding event in your life? You got something you'd like to share with How us? About, okay. Outstanding event. It comes to mind. Oh, <clears throat> Catherine, I've, I've, I have been blessed with working with so many outstanding people over the years, and um, and I've been blessed with their feelings of commonality and common common uh, goals that um, I don't think any single event would match that. Okay. Uh, three, I guess three years ago, uh, one of my former students from Illinois, my, one of my graduate students from Illinois, arranged what was to be a surprise party for <clears throat> me in in Detroit. They decided to have it in Detroit where the Ford people would be around. And people came from California, they came from Washington, they came from uh, all over. Uh, two or three faculty members from here came. Uh, Students from here came. Uh, former Ford colleagues came, and I described it to to my wife Jean as that it was it was as nice a wake as one could have ever <laughs> ever had. Isn't that at marvelous? The, at the time of of, uh, of being alive. For the researchers, did you walk in? They were already there. Or well, how did no, we? I knew. They told me about it the week before. <laughs> So uh, I knew that it was. There was uh, something on the on the in the way at radar. <laughs> yeah. But um, and my whole family, entire family, was here. But um, that's a wonderful thing. You don't. You you can't. One can't. Um, one can't thank people. Right. Enough. Agreed. Yes. And uh, I've had a, an unusually strong support from from my dear wife. Right. Yeah. She has always said, "I thought you had a grand plan about life and where you're going, but I guess <laughs> not." <laughs> and I don't. I didn't. <laughs> That's all right. In closing, any uh, comments that you'd like to share with the researchers? Anything special in closing that you'd like to, or you think we've covered everything? Or any questions that I didn't um, ask? <clears throat> the. Uh, the pleasure of living in a small city with a big university uh, can't be overemphasized. It offers all of the all of the uh, pleasures in terms of the benefits and very few of the deficiencies of a large city. Uh, and Purdue is a is a very friendly community. West Lafayette is a very friendly community. When we came to West Lafayette, uh, 
my wife went into business with two other ladies. Uh, and as a result, she became acquainted with most people in the cities, both Lafayette, West Lafayette. And I became acquainted with the family at Purdue. And so it was some of the best of both worlds. Right. And um, so we, we've had a, just a lovely experience at, at Purdue. And I think people tend to look at this as a little town and therefore there's nothing to, to enjoy when there are so many right. pleasures and uh, so much intellectual exactly. activities. I agree. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Sure. Compton. I really appreciate it. This concludes the interview. I thank, thank you. Thank you very much. My Catherine. pleasure. Uh -uh.